Let's get into the word of the Lord here tonight. Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 1. We will begin reading at verse number 5, verses 5 through 14. Book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 through 14. I do feel like God's got something to speak to somebody here tonight. Maybe you're in a uh, season and you just feel like it's an impossibility and you don't quite know how you're going to get through it. I feel like God's got something to say here for you tonight. Luke chapter 1, verse number 5. The Bible says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, the course of Abi, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. I'm going to stop there, and uh, we're just going to talk a little bit tonight about lessons from the barren. We're going to look through scripture and search throughout those that were barren all throughout the scripture and see what we can learn from those that had the curse of barrenness. But in spite of the impossibility, you will find all throughout scripture, those that were barren found something within them that they could believe that in spite of their circumstance, God could work something out and they could be fruitful on the other side. Anybody desiring for God to move in this place tonight? Amen. Why don't you lift your hands one more time before you're seated? Let's lift our voices and just ask that God would speak to us. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your word. Pray, God, that you would use me tonight for your glory. Give me clarity of thought, God. Allow me to speak as you want me to speak. Lord, let the gifts of the Spirit flow in this house. God, we don't have time to waste one service. Anoint me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor before you're seated and say, you look better than I do. That was your opportunity to compliment your wife there, husbands. Amen. Very first commandment we receive from the Lord is found in Genesis 1, 28. The Bible says, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over everything that moveth upon the earth. We see that the Lord, straight from the get-go, has a love for fruitfulness. One day he was walking in Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 19. And when he sees a fig tree in the way and he came to it and found that there was nothing thereon but leaves only, he said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. God has a fascination with fruitfulness. He wants us to be a fruitful people. We read even in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse number 19, the Bible says, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground is barren. When they got ready to describe the lack of fruit in this city, they said it is a barren place. According to the prayer book commentary, barrenness was a fearsome reproach among Jewish women, and to be delivered from this curse was the occasion of the most extravagant of joy. It was even the law in the Old Testament that if your wife was barren, that you could marry another so that you could have children. We see the very first occasion of barrenness found in Genesis 11 and 30. The Bible says, but... Sarai was born or barren and she had no child. This barrenness lasted for so long that when God finally got ready to heal her of her barrenness, the Bible says she literally laughed at God. And yet in this barrenness, you find that Isaac was produced because 
we know that would be from that young man, the beginning of the lineage of Jesus Christ. Then her son, Isaac, has a wife and she too is barren. We see in Genesis 25 and 21, the Bible says that Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. We see from this barren womb comes Jacob and Esau, the continuation of the lineage of Jesus, Jacob, the one that would produce the 12 tribes that would, or the 12 sons that would become the 12 tribes of Israel. We even see in the book of Judges, found in Judges 13, verses 2 through 3, and there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was also barren. And she bare not, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. The son that would be born to this woman would be by the man by the name of Samson, the strongest man to ever be in the Bible. You find in 1 Samuel 1 and 5, Hannah, Hannah's barrenness was unique because the Bible says according to to the scripture that she was barren because the Lord had shut up her womb. However, because of her prayer and supplication, you and I understand that she produces the son by the name of Samuel. It was said of Samuel in 1 Samuel 3 and 19, and Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and he did not let any of his words fall to the ground. This son would also be the one that would anoint David, the king, after God's own heart. Even in our text here tonight, we see that Zacharias and Elizabeth, the priest that would be in the presence of God burning incense, his wife too was barren, and the Bible makes it very clear that they were past the age of conception. They were old. However, from this barren womb, we see that John the Baptist is born, the one that Jesus would say in Matthew 11 and 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of the women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Think with me for just a moment as we breeze through everybody that I have given you examples of. You find Isaac, the beginning of the lineage of Jesus, the promised son of Abraham. Jacob, the continuation of the lineage of Jesus, the one who would produce the sons that would become the 12 tribes of Israel. Samson, the strongest man in the Bible, the one that with the jawbone of a donkey would kill Philistines, the man that would take hold of pillars and with a great anointing and act of strength, he would literally pull down the foundation of a home. Samuel, the prophet whose words never hit the ground, this great prophet, John the Baptist, the one, as we've already said, that Jesus would say is the greatest, the one, the heralder of the kingdom is coming. Jesus' kingdom was on the way, and it was John the Baptist, a son of a barren womb. This man would stand as a product of barrenness. All of these great men were men that were born from barrenness. What made the barren so powerful? What made the barren produce such a profound, prophetic, and powerful people. I believe that when you want to understand what made the barren so powerful, that you have to turn to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 6, and verse number 16. You find that when they begin to assess how this wall was built, that they end this by saying this work could only have been wrought of God. I believe that that is the answer to why the barren produce such powerful sons because it's from a place of impossibility. It's from a place where women would, would, would be in such great joy that at the hope of the possibility of going beyond their barrenness, that it was from this place of impossibility that God said, I'm going to bring a promise. I'm going to bring something out of your impossibility. And from that was produced the powerful and the prophetic. The Bible says that 
when you look at this text with Nehemiah, that they were cast down in their own eyes. The New Living Translation says it this way. They were frightened and humiliated at the work that was done. And when they looked at that wall being built, they said, only God could do this. And when they realized that it was a work done by God, it caused frightness and humiliation in the eyes of their enemy. I believe that when you and I have an impossibility, something that seems as though to me and you that there is no hope in the natural, that's when God says, you're set up for me to do my greatest work yet. I realize that we are here tonight and we see a list of prayer requests. We see many different needs all over this building. You've come with your need. You've come with your struggle. You've come with your personal impossibility. And maybe you have written off the fact that in the natural, it just can't be done. But I want you to know that in the supernatural tonight, God can do something profound and powerful from a place of impossibility. We begin to look at the barren, and I want to take a, a few points here that I believe that, that we can learn some lessons from these barren people that will teach us how God can also move on our impossibility. The first thing that I notice about the barren is that they are desperate. They are desperate. The Bible says that Isaac entreated the Lord. That word entreated in one translation literally means he put himself in a posture of intercession. He prayed with intensity. He sought the Lord with fervor. He said, I realize that what I'm praying for is impossible with man, but with God, with God, all things are possible. And so through this posture of desperation, he would not quit praying. He would not quit seeking. He would not quit pressing until God did what he needed God to do. And I believe that if you put yourself in a posture of desperation and you keep coming back and you keep pressing and you keep saying, I will not quit in spite of the impossibility, in spite of what things around me are saying, in spite of what the world is saying, Saying, I will not stop until God moves on my behalf. Amen. God cannot ignore a desperate cry. God cannot ignore a spirit of desperation. I love the story found in Luke chapter 18 that as Jesus was leaving or coming nigh unto Jericho, that, that out of nowhere he hears this cry coming from a man, this cry saying, Jesus have mercy on me, thou son of David. It was a cry from a man that was that was in this condition. He he couldn't move. He 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 was here. You know him as blind Bartimaeus, and he's here and, and, and he's and he's hungry and he's passionate that God is gonna do something on his behalf. And while he's put in a position of impossibility. He did not let the impossibility stop him from letting out a cry of desperation that said, I realize I've probably tried everything. He's probably done anything and everything he could do to have his miracle. But in spite of the impossibility, it did not stop him from raising his voice when he knew Jesus was near. They tried to tell him, you've got to calm down. You've got to be quiet. But let me tell you something. When you're desperate, it doesn't matter who tries to quiet you down. It doesn't matter who's trying to say, you better relax. Do you not realize that it's Wednesday night? Do you not realize that we're here for a Bible study? Friend, I feel like on a Wednesday night that there can be a cry of desperation that somebody says, I'm not leaving here until I get my miracle. He pressed and he pressed and he cried out unto the Lord and he would not let people telling him, you've got to be quiet, you've got to calm down, stop him from getting his miracle. When you're desperate, it doesn't matter who's around you, it doesn't matter what the circumstance is, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, there's going to be a sound that rises up out of you that says, I'm more hungry than I am worried about what you think of me. I'm more desperate, I am more careless in this moment. I'm here to get a miracle. I'm here for God to do something on my behalf. Is anybody here desperate for God to do something in your life? Ooh. Hallelujah. 
Come on, let's lift our hands and worship right now. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Woo. Praise God. I find that the barren are people that are desperate and they really don't care what you think about them. They really don't care. They're so hungry for God to touch them. They're so hungry for God to move upon their behalf. They, they just don't care who's around them. They don't care what's going on. They've got a desire, and they're not going to leave or quit until God meets that desire. Sometimes I believe God leaves us in our situations long enough until we get into a posture of desperation. Sometimes God just wants to see, are you willing to get desperate for what you need? I'm willing to get desperate for my miracle. Woo. The second thing that I note about the barren, not only are they desperate, but they're also persistent. They're persistent. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 1 and 12 that as Hannah began to seek the Lord, for the end of her barrenness, the Bible says something as she continued praying before the Lord. There was something within her that said, I'm not getting up until this is done. She had a persistency about her. I know you've came to the front and you've had somebody anoint your head with oil before, but I wonder if you're persistent enough to come to the front and have somebody anoint your head with oil again. Come on, I know you've asked God to heal you before, but I wonder if you're so hungry that you will become so persistent that it doesn't matter if it didn't happen before. Come on, I know you heard the preacher pray the prayer of faith and said, if you need a miracle, it's going to happen. And maybe it didn't happen that time, but I wonder if there's a persistency within you that says every time that altar's open, Come on, every time that altar is open, I'm pressing in because there's a persistency within me that says, I'm not going to stop until I get my miracle. I'm not going to stop until I get my deliverance. I'm not going to stop until I get my breakthrough. The barren are persistent. I found something peculiar today. It's kind of been in my spirit all day that and I've, been, I've been studying and just reading the book of Esther and I, I love the story of the book of Esther. It's so uh, uh, beautiful how God weaves the, through, through the book of Esther. You see his hand moving all the way through it. But one of the things that I found so unique and beautiful is that God never speaks one time in the entire book of Esther. You never find the voice of God one time. You never find God speaking to her uncle Mordecai. You never find anything. You know what you find in the book of Esther? You find people being faithful in spite of their circumstance. You know what you find? You find a man that says, I realize that they're coming to kill my people, but in spite of that, I'm going to be persistent. And he didn't stop praying. He didn't stop fasting. And he didn't stop believing. God never spoke. He never heard, thus says the word of the Lord. He just understood that these principles work in the kingdom of God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. And if God never speaks, I'm just going to believe. He's going to hold fast to his word. There's something about somebody that's willing to be persistent that causes God to work on your behalf. Amen. You see that the barren are persistent. I love the story of the unjust judge. You see it in Luke chapter 18, verse number one. And he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always, men ought always to pray and not faint. The parable that he's trying to teach us is you should keep praying. The parable that he's, he, he's about to show us, he said, this, th this parable, this parabolic teaching that I'm about to bring to you is, is to show you, you better keep praying. Don't faint. Think about what he's saying. Don't quit. E even though your prayer may not have been answered the first time, keep praying. E even though it may not have happened when you wanted it to happen, keep praying. Even though it may not have happened how you wanted it to happen, Keep praying. Keep believing. He says that men ought always to pray and not faint. Saying there was in this city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. 
and he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because the widow troubleth me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me. Weary me. If an unjust judge can get weary with a petition that just keeps showing up. Brother Verbal Bean, he uh, was a great evangelist. And if you've never read his book on prayer, I suggest that you read it. It's a wonderful book. In that book of prayer, he teaches a type of prayer that's called a memorial prayer. It's a prayer where you keep building up a memorial until it's time for it to come to pass. Friend, you got to understand that sometimes just because God doesn't answer you the first time, he's just wanting to see, are you willing to build that memorial? Woo. And you keep coming and you keep praying and you keep praying. Come on, that's what made the barren so powerful. Hannah continued to pray. She said, I'm not getting off of this altar until something happens in my life. This is a lesson we have to learn from the barren. The barren have this idea that, that I, I realize my condition, it's not easy. I realize that my condition, it's not pleasant. I realize that my condition is impossible. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep fasting. You've got to get a tenacity within you. I know, I know it didn't happen when you thought it was going to happen. I know it didn't happen the way you thought it was going to happen. But if you just keep praying, if you just keep fasting, if you keep being faithful to the principles of the word of God, I'm telling you, it shall come to pass. Before you know it, God's going to do the work on your behalf. I keep going back to that. That, that book of Esther because even though, even though God didn't speak, you can't help but see the hand of God moving. He sets up a queen right in the midst of all of this who happens to be a Jew and how God, he orchestrates the whole thing. Why? Because somebody was faithful to the principles of the kingdom. When you're faithful to the principles of the kingdom, when you're faithful to the word of God, he cannot help but move on your behalf. It may not happen how you think it's going to happen, but if you look at the end of the story, you'll say, man, look how God worked it out on my behalf. Look how God just wove his way right in the middle of my mess and made a way where there was no way. <laughs> Woo. Something that we must learn from the barren is that they are a persistent people. We've got to become persistent in this hour with our prayer, with our petition. We've got to be faithful in this hour to the things of God and to the principles of God because when you're faithful, God's going to work it out on your behalf. God's going to work it out on your behalf. The third lesson that I learned from the barren is that the barren are praisers and they are worshipers. We read in Luke chapter 1, verse number 9, when we begin to see the process of which Zacharias and his wife's barrenness was healed. The Bible says, according to the custom of the priest's office, it was his lot to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. This was a, a rare moment for the high priest to get to burn incense. And when he walked in there and he got to burn incense, this incense is a type of worship. It's a sweet savor unto the Lord. When he was in there giving off a type of worship, God moves upon him and heals his wife of barrenness. You've got to think about that. When he put himself in a posture of worship, God couldn't help but heal the impossibility. Even when you don't feel like worshiping. Now, I know that we have a misconception of what worship is. In our opinion, worship is when we just come and we lift our hands. That's more praise. But I want to focus on worship before I focus on praise for just a minute. Abraham showed us what worship was when he said, I and the, la and the lad, we're, we're going to go yonder to worship. Worship is a, is a sacrifice. Worship, worship is something that's, that's it, it, it's really something that begins to be like groanings. And, 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 it's, and it's to lay before the Lord and give it all that you have. It's when you, it's when you lay down and those groanings which cannot be uttered. 
Man, I can remember uh, I, just just a few days ago, I was in a service in, in, in St. Louis, and uh, I was preaching, and I said, man, I remember back in the day when, when, when services would get so heavy, and the power of God would get to fallen, and I would hear, I would hear the women in the church, and the men in the church, they didn't pray anything, they, they, they had such a burden, and, and such a spirit of worship came over, over them, where all you could hear was, oh, it was those deep groanings that would come from within. They, 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 they couldn't pray pretty. Hey, they, they couldn't let anything out. It was just an, oh, it was that groaning down from within. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever been put in a posture where you couldn't pray your pretty prayer? You couldn't even, you couldn't even muster up the strength to get out a word anymore. All you could say was, oh, and those groanings begin to rise up. I believe that that is that sweet incense of worship when that begins to come from a deep place from within. When you begin to lift your hands and those groanings and they just begin to say, oh God, and it comes down. That's a posture of worship. When it comes from a place of depth out of your soul, you say, I, I'm not satisfied with where I'm at and I'm not going to stop praying until something deep rises up from within me, my mind. Woo, you ought to lift your hands and let a worship come out of you right now. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let there be a depth from within you right now. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. My, my. It was his lot to burn incense. And while he was burning that incense, he put himself in that posture of worship. Ooh, he couldn't help but get a miracle. He couldn't help but hear from God. The second thing that we see that barren are not also, or third thing is that barren are not also worshipers, but they're also praisers. Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 54. He said, sing. O barren, that thou didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, that thou didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth thy curtains of habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and thou shalt make the desolate cities to be inhabited. The barren people are praisers. I know we have been in a series with Pastor, uh, and, and I, I even saw that Brother Woodward, as only he can, just jumped right in the middle of, of a series and just wowed everybody. But I find it very interesting that even though they were barren, Isaiah prophetically writes, sing anyhow, <laughs> praise anyhow, prepare anyhow. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but barren people prepare for the promise even when the promise isn't there. You know how you prepare for your promise? You praise. I realize it's not yet, but I'm going to praise him as though it is already. Woo, you feel that? I realize it hasn't. I know you haven't got your miracle. I know you haven't got your breakthrough. I know you haven't got your deliverance. I, I, I know you haven't got it yet, but you know what? I'm going to praise him like it's already happened. Woo, come on, you feel that? Sing, oh barren. Come on. Woo. My, my, my. You ought to take a little bit of time right now and just prepare with praise for what God wants to do in your life. Hallelujah. My, my, my. Woo. Come on, praise him. For, would you just take 30 seconds and praise the Lord? Something's moving right now. My, 
my, my. Barren are praisers. Why am I praising? The miracle hasn't happened yet. You're praising ahead of the miracle. Why am I praising? I haven't got the financial breakthrough that I've been waiting on. You're praising ahead of that breakthrough. My children haven't come back to the Lord like I thought they would. You're praising ahead of their return. Ooh, come on, that prodigal, his father was always prepared for his son to come back. <laughs> You ought to prepare every day like your miracle is already, even though it may not be yet. You ought to prepare. Come on. He said, lengthen, strengthen. You better get ready. I know it's not yet, but if you'll start singing and praising like it is already, you got to get ahead of the miracle. My, my, my. Barren are praisers. They're not afraid to praise ahead of what God's going to do. Because praise is what precedes the promise. Come on, David got ahead of the Ark of the Covenant when it was coming home. He said, I'm not going to let praise be behind glory. I'm going to get my praise out ahead of glory. And when he got ahead of it, he went six paces and he would stop. He went as far as humanity could take him. Come on, six is the number of man. He went as far as humanity could take him. And he said, before glory can go any further, I've got to get out of the flesh. And i got to get in the spirit here just for a moment. And I'm going to have to pray. Hey, and he praised and worshiped and sacrificed all the way to the city. And when he got to the city, he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to take off my kingly robe. You know what praise does? Praise brings equality. Worship brings equality. Nobody's better than anybody else when you're in the presence of glory. When the glory of God comes, it's not preacher and saint. Come on. It's not you versus me. It's all of us. And we're all just doing one thing. That's why when you get up in heaven, what does it say? It says that the elders cast down their crowns. There's only one wearing a crown in heaven, friend, and it's the king of kings. I'm going to take my crown off. I'm not worried about anything else. I just want to get in. Woo, there's victory in this house right now. There's joy in this house right now. My, my, my. We can't ever be like David's wife, daughter of Saul, elevated up in her tower, looking down upon a praiser. Come on, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I'm praising for. You don't know what I'm worshiping for. Don't look down on my praise. You don't know what type of hell I've been through this week. You don't know the forces I had to fight to get to church on a Wednesday night. You better believe I'm praising God. You better believe I'm worshiping in spite of what my week looks like, in spite of what's going on in my life. Come on, let's worship him right now. The anointing of the Lord is in this house. The spirit of the Lord, I know it's Wednesday night, but I think we ought to just pause right here and magnify the Lord. I'm preaching to somebody that's in an impossible situation. I'm trying to preach to somebody that feels like there's no hope where you're at right now. You ought to get ahead of glory. You ought to get ahead of it right now. Say, I'm going to praise before there's fruitfulness. I'm going to praise before it happens. In spite of my circumstance, in spite of what I'm going through. Hallelujah. Man, I know it's Wednesday night, but it feels like Sunday night in this house right now. I tell you. Come on, do what you feel in the Holy Ghost right now. I'm done. The Holy Ghost is disrupting this service. The power of the Lord is messing this service up. Come on, uh, do what you feel in the Holy Ghost. I think there's miracles in this house. Uh, you need a miracle, you ought to praise God right now. You need a, 
You need a breakthrough. You ought to praise God right now. He's ministering in this house. Come on, that's it. In spite of the impossibility, I'm going to praise. In spite of the circumstance, I'm going to praise. In spite of what it looks like, I'm going to praise. I tell you what I feel in the Holy Ghost right now. Somebody ought to link up with somebody. You ought to have a praise partner right now. You ought to join up. Come on, young lady, grab with another young lady. Come on, sir, grab another hand of another man in this house. Uh, let's praise together. Come on, let's worship together, dance together. Come on, jump with them that jump. Uh, rejoice with them that rejoice. Uh, come on, that's it. Praise together just for a little while. Come on, the Holy Ghost is doing something on this Wednesday night. I speak to every... Can we put the prayer request back on the screen? Come on, keep praising right now. The gifts of the Spirit are flowing in this house. I want you to begin to call the name of these names on the list right now. The miraculous power of the Holy Ghost is moving. Uh, come on, I speak a miracle to every name. Uh, I speak a miracle to every name. Uh, I speak a miracle to every name. Icarando lobo sataha. Iarreando lobo sataha. That's it. Speak strength into your neighbor's body. Speak joy into your neighbor's body. Come on, students. I know you're about to, about to go back to school. I plead the blood of Jesus over you. I plead the blood of Jesus over your mind when you go back onto that college campus. I plead the blood of Jesus over your mind.